Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I would like to talk to you today about open notebook science, and there's going to be some chemistry that I'll be using as examples, but hopefully you can take more of the, of the general view of what it is that I'm doing and hopefully see how it might apply to other fields. So let's get started here. Okay. So the first question is, uh, why is it that you might be interested in openness in, in chemistry? So I, I want to present basically some advantages, not just from the people who might benefit from your work, but also why, as a researcher, it might make sense to be open. So I'll start with a, with a little story, something very specific about research work done in chemistry and the current state of, of you know, how open things are available and what kind of, of problem that, that, that's actually causing. So again, I'm going to keep this very general, but we're doing some drug discovery work where we're trying to make analogs of taxol. And basically, these compounds fit inside a protein, as you can see here. So that was our motivation for making these compounds. And the syntheses that we chose are very simple. You basically mix these two compounds together in the, in the presence of a suitable base. And you should be able to generate these two compounds on the right, which we had predicted, you know, have some potential for, for being active. Now, the, the, the point of mentioning this is that if you find a compound that has already been made, then that's good news because it means that you don't have to start from scratch to go back to the lab and reinvent the wheel. So the top compound had not been previously made, but the bottom one actually had a few reports. And so... You know, we were very happy by that. Again, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We just want to be able to repeat a procedure that actually exists. So this is a, a, you know, I just picked this as an example, but this is a classic case of what happens if a chemist tries to repeat an experiment they find in literature. So what is the current standard for sufficient information when you're communicating organic chemistry? So, you know, from the librarian standpoint, right, most of the work that you're going to be finding is peer-reviewed. And by definition, all peer-reviewed published documentation has been approved by at least three parties. Obviously, the authors, right? So presumably, the authors want that information to be understood by other chemists, and they want them to be able to repeat it. It's also been approved by editors. So the editors want to make sure that what they publish, uh, you know, that, that people are going to be able to use whatever's being published. And third, by the reviewers, who are supposed to double check to make sure, in fact, that everything, that there is enough information. But in practice, let's see where, that, where this can actually break down. So if we're looking for those reactions that I was talking about, we actually have a little interface, and I, I spoke with some of you about uh, how we can access this, this kind of information. And we can access the lab notebook, as I'll show shortly, but also we can access papers that are, you know, also collected in this database. So this first hit, okay, that compound on the right, that was the one that I mentioned earlier that had been made before. And this is from a peer-reviewed publication. And basically, if you read the details of this, uh, it says that 30 grams of sodium hydroxide in an unknown amount of ethanol were added. So if you're trying to repeat an experiment, you know, it matters actually how much liquid you need to add. And it's not a trivial thing, the fact that it didn't say how much liquid needed to be added, because these compounds are not very soluble at all. So if you need an enormous volume, you know, you're going to have to start guessing how much you need to add, and you're going to start, you know, reinventing the wheel. Obviously, the people who did this knew how much they actually added, but that was omitted, and that was something that was not caught by the reviewers or by the editor. And it turns out that that's actually a, a significant problem. Another example here, uh, basically it says here that the aldehyde was saturated in ethanol and then added to 50 mils of one-to-one -one ethanol water. Uh, so basically, not, not, not to focus too much on the chemistry, but basically this would indicate that when you were to pour one into the other, the starting material would actually precipitate which is actually not good. So there's something wrong with this, and I don't know what it is. And so, again, you're going to have to, to start guessing and start experimenting with something that somebody has already done. And worst of all, in this particular paper, they claim to have made this compound, but there was no details whatsoever. They referred to another 
journal, and it wasn't even the same compound. So this is actually a very good example of what happens in chemistry and why the current system that we have often fails and causes a lot of, you know, wasting time because you have to, you know, guess what, what people actually did. And, and so this is sort of the point is that if chemists provide more information, you know, maybe all the way to the lab notebook, as I'll show, then all of these things can be avoided. So uh, it turns out that my student was, in fact, able to repeat the procedure, but it took many, many different changes from what the other uh, papers had actually reported. So what we do with Open Notebook Science is my students keep a lab notebook. It's online. Specifically, we use a wiki and we use Google so spreadsheets, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the, the point is, is that it is, it's live, it's indexed, it's available you know, on, on, on the live web. And we include the so-called failed experiments. Now, uh, it's not just a, a question of an experiment being successful or failed. A successful experiment, we would define that the, the student did a reaction, they obtained the compound, the compound that they wanted, they characterized it, they have a yield, you know, and everything is, is, is done like that. But there's other scenarios besides simply the reaction not working. It could be an experiment that's in progress. It could be that the, that the student did the experiment but didn't finish analyzing it. There's all kinds of other things. Or it could be that they isolated a product but it wasn't quite pure enough. So basically that accounts for about 90% of the experiments in our lab notebooks. And so that 90% is uh, typically never communicated to anyone. It stays in the lab notebook, and when the student leaves that group, you know, it's, it's rarely actually accessed again, and there's a wealth of information in that. And that's part of the motivation of why I got involved with Open Notebook Science is to make that, that information accessible and usable. So this is an example of a, a so-called uh, failed experiment where the student mixed these two compounds, did not get a precipitate, but more importantly, it turns out we can understand why it didn't work. There is a link here to the reference, uh, the onschallenge.wikispaces experiment 269. If we click on that link, it takes us to the actual lab notebook page. And the way that I have my students maintain a lab notebook is there, <clears throat> in addition to the objective, the discussion, that's not shown here because of space, but there's a log section which actually has the time and what was actually done or what was actually observed. And if we, if we look at this carefully, we go down to 1341, and you can see that the solution was observed to separate into two layers. So that is actually the, the critical observation that, that tells you that the wrong solvent was used because it didn't fully dissolve. Okay, now the fact that any chemist now can read this and understand this, they could use that information they simply, if, if the only information they got is that it doesn't work, that's not terribly helpful because you don't understand how it didn't work. So this is, you know, a, a, a clear-cut case of a, of a so-called failed experiment, which actually has useful information. So, again, I'm calling this Open Notebook Science, and if you go on Wikipedia, there's some more examples of this kind of thing and uh, some, some uh, articles written about this. Now, a successful experiment in our uh, query engine will actually show up with a green check mark. And in this case, you know, you have the yield and you have the minimum information in this, in this summary. And then again, if you were to click on that link, it would take you to the full experiment with all of the associated raw data to, to explain how it actually happened. Now, I'm going to talk about using Google Spreadsheets um, in my talk. So the, the wiki itself basically would have you know, what you would typically put in a paper notebook. It has sentences, it will have that log, it will have the discussion. But for any kind of numerical data, we tend to use Google Spreadsheets pretty extensively. And there's a couple of reasons for that. So they're freely available. They can be duplicated and, you know, replicated if, if, if anybody wants to uh, do something similar to what we're doing. They don't have to get any new software. This is available. We can actually create code will uh, create archives from these Google spreadsheets. But probably most importantly, you can actually run code behind the Google spreadsheets, uh, which are the, the Google app scripts, which I'll talk about shortly. 
But one of the things that you can do inside the Google spreadsheet is put a link, for example, to spectroscopic information like an NMR. So if, as, as a supervisor, if I'm looking at my students' work and I wanted to see, for example, the purity of their product or their starting materials, inside of the Google sp spreadsheet, I would click under the view NMR and it would pop up a spectrum. And this is a spectrum uh, that uses ChemDoodle, so that it's uh, freely available, it's open, and you can actually interact with the NMR spectrum. So with your mouse, if you uh, left click and drag, you can actually zoom into any peak you want and get information that otherwise would require you to sit down at a printer and print out 15 different expansions. Whereas here, we don't need to print out NMR anymore, uh, really for, for any reason. We can just interact with it. So this is something, you know, whether you're interested in doing open uh, chemistry or not, it's something that really should, you know, that a lot of chemists really should find useful. Okay, so I'm going to step a little bit more into the, into the teaching uh, arena. So we're talking about collecting information from the lab, but what about collecting information from different sources in, in an open way? So I teach this uh, course called Chemical Information Retrieval. I'm teaching it now, actually. I teach it every fall. And the idea of the class is how to find chemical information, and by the way, if I, I, I spoke with some of you who might be interested, uh, those three links at the bottom, those are FAQs, uh, the three years, about 30 questions each, and they'll have, you know, anything relating to details of chemical information, like what's the ACS's policy on, uh, on green open access, things, th things like that. So my students use this, and one of the thing, one of the main assignments in this course is actually to collect information like physical properties for compounds of their choice. So when I started this, um, I decided to put it in, in a Google spreadsheet. So the, the assignment was the student had to pick five compounds, they had to pick five properties each, and five, find five different sources for each one of those properties. So in this case, for example, we have DDT, the insecticide, and you see we've got five different boiling points and you've got numbers that uh, mainly agree, but there's a couple of pretty strong outliers, right? So you can see here in the second case, right, we have 230 Fahrenheit. This is from a government site, NIOSH, and we have to convert it to a common unit, in this case, the degree Celsius, and you can see that there's an enormous difference between this site and the other three that are experimental. And in this case, it's probably the situation that uh, this was probably supposed to be Celsius and somehow it was marked incorrectly as Fahrenheit. And you start to see a lot of that. So the, the point of the exercise was really to teach my students that there's no such thing as a trusted source. You can't go to one place and expect that you can trust the data. There's no shortcuts. The only way that you can, you can gain some confidence in the data set is by getting as many different sources as possible and looking if the data converge or if they don't. So this is what they did, and we started to collect all of these different data points. And then we started to analyze this. And so, for example, for melting points, right, we could see uh, that uh, EGCG, which is the active ingredient in green tea, for example, there it was there was strong outliers with respect to melting point. Same thing with cyclohexadone and, and warfarin. And in collaboration uh, with my partner, Andrew Lang at Oral Roberts University, he created some code that enabled us to interact with the data to be able to more easily look at these outliers and, and, and try to make sense of them. So this is really the same Google spreadsheet, but through uh, a, a more, uh, through a better user interface over the web. And you can see in this case that there, there's two numbers. These are in Kelvin. All right, but there's, you see you got a 414 and a 491. These are extremely divergent. And if you try to use the philosophy of the trusted source, you're gonna have a problem here because one of the sources is a period journal and the other source is the Merck Index. So generally, either one of those sources, you know, you would teach your students that they're good. In this case, they obviously can't both, both be correct, right? So. Therefore, you know, there is, you have to continue to get measurements. And in this case, if you were not able to get any more measurements, 
you simply have to admit that you don't know with any certainty what the melting point of this compound is. So that's that's quite problematic. So we can do the same thing um, with cyclohexanone, for example. In this case, we have a value, and this is marked because it's beyond one standard deviation. So you can start to think about marking these as outliers and not counting them once you start to collect enough data points. Now, when we looked at the most popular sources, so remember that the students had access to uh, all of the commercial databases, uh, Drexel used Reaxis, SciFinder, and of course, anything else like uh, chemical vendors, Sigma Aldrich and Alpha Acer uh, are both uh, chemical vendors, and they happen to be the most frequently used sources that, that my students uh, picked. You might be familiar with Wolfram Alpha. So some of these you might recognize that go beyond chemistry, but, but uh, even Wikipedia is on here. That's important to note here that these are not the, the primary sources that the students found. So in other words, if they found a number, let's say, in Wikipedia, they weren't allowed to use Wikipedia as the source if Wikipedia had a reference. So they had to continue to go down the chain of provenance until they got to a point where there was nothing left. So actually, the fact that Wikipedia is here is not even great because it means that it didn't actually have a reference for those compounds. So, but basically, I blogged about this after we had done our first run, and I was contacted by the vice president of marketing of Alpha Acer, the, the, the second, uh, link here, the, the, the second most frequently used resource uh, that, that my students used. And we had a conversation, and they were interested in, in collaborating in some way. And I asked them if they'd be willing to donate their melting points to the public domain. And they agreed to do it. So this was fantastic because we got about 13,000 melting points. And it was very important that they agreed to donate it to the public domain, CC0, right? Because it allowed us now to use this for any purpose. It allowed us to remix this with any other open data source and to actually do something useful. And that's sort of the point also I'm trying to make here is that it's really uh, of enormous value if you can get data in an, open, in an open format because oftentimes you'll see like a melting point study where they use a proprietary database and you can't even see the data that they use to do the modeling. It'll literally say in the supplementary data, data not available. And so you can't reproduce it, you can't leverage it. So... This was great, and you know they provided the data in, in a format that wasn't exactly completely numeric. So we had to actually we had to convert ranges to single numbers. We had to remove um, letters like DEC, which means de decompose things like that. So we cleaned it up, and that started actually something pretty useful. We managed to get a donation from the EPA as well. They donated the, their FizzProp database all of the melting points. They donated to the public domain. So in the end, we actually had a collection of 27,000 open melting points, and we were able to actually to start to uh, curate some of it, look for you know where the melting points were coming closely within each other. We were able to build models, and, and you know, this, this kick-started the whole project. So once we converted into a database format, and again, this is simply in a Google spreadsheet, um, Andy was able to create this nice little interface where not only could you select a compound and look at a melting point, but you could also put a smarts. And that's basically a way to do a substructure search. So if you see the smarts here, basically there's, there's a little uh, string of text, and that's basically asking, find all the compounds that have a benzene ring and a C double bond O. And so it actually returned all of these compounds that have that pattern and that have a melting point between 0 and 25. So once you start to have all the, the, the open data, you can start to do some, some interesting things with it. And now, because we had enough data, we could actually start to really do some real comparisons to find out if there were outliers and where they actually came from. So one of the data sources that we had was from... And, MDPI, and it was, it was a couple of thousand compounds there, a couple of thousand melting points, I should say. And you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have five different sources, and a pattern is clearly emerging, right? We have 77, 77.5, 76.7, and then one 
that's at 150 that uh, is clearly an outlier. And again, if we only had two values, if I only had a 77.5 and a 150, I would be in the same scenario I was with PCG. But because we have so many data points now, we can start to be more confident to say that this is in fact incorrect and this is an outlier. Uh, I talked about the uh, the EPA donated the FISPROP data set. So it's, the EPI is another name for it. And again, here we can see that uh, we have two values that are close and then one that's you know clearly off. So we, we have been able to start to basically identify these outliers. And the way in which we handle them, we never delete any numbers from any source. All we do is we mark them as do not use, and it shows up in red. So when you look at the average, the, the stuff that's marked as outliers will not be average, but you can still see what it is. And if you wanted to use it for whatever reason, you certainly could. So this is kind of the opposite of the trusted source model. Um, here's, here's an example where the melting point for ethanol, uh, clearly there's a vast number of values that are very close to minus 114. And then there is a value of minus 130 and a value of minus 144. And at this point, you know, basically I marked these uh, clearly out of range. So I gave the reason as to why we did it. And so now, you know, this is pretty neat. Now you can actually say that you can be fairly confident that you know what the melting point of ethanol is. Uh, whereas if you had only looked up, the, let's say, the Alpha Acer catalog, which, you know, a chemist would typically do. You know, when I was in grad school, you didn't look for five different sources. You basically grabbed the chemical vendor that, you know, was generally reliable and you used the value. And so that's been a major problem going forward. These numbers keep repeating themselves. And, and once you have open collections, all of a sudden you shine a light on everything and that note, you know, you fixed it forever. Okay, so that's really the, you know, one of the points of making it open. We also found other pretty strange problems. For example, in this MDPI da data set, we found several compounds, the same compounds that had two different melting points in the same database. So, and they, they could be separated by a lot. Like we have uh, this first one, 132 and 179.5. So mathematically, if you tried to build a model with this, you, you couldn't build you know, a, a good model because you don't know what the melting point is. Actually, it can't be right. And so that's, again, one of the things, once you start to gather all these feeds, you can start to uh, more clearly uh, make some cuts. And this here is uh, is a pretty important point. If you this particular data set, I'm not picking on it. Just an example. Um, the way that it's classified, uh, it's classified as high trust level because it's original author data. And this is really, I think, one of the problems with chemical information and you know, probably other fields as well. Is this whole model of the trusted source is really flawed because it it tends to, to favor the propagation of these errors that are extremely difficult to correct. And so, you know, unfortunately, there's no shortcut to this. You really do have to get as many different sources as you can and see what uh, converges. So all of the melting point collections that we have, they're all put on this index page. And as we clean up, as we merge and, and do whatever, uh, we basically upload um, as Google Spreadsheets or as Excel, and you know you can download any of the ones that, that you would like to. Uh, so you know we're not passing judgment; we're basically just offering it, and you guys decide what it is that, that you want to use. I mean, we can recommend one that that we use for our own purposes, but that's just uh, that's our threshold that, that we're using. So let me give you like a really concrete example of how bad these melting points can be. So this compound, 4-benzyltoluene, these are all of the numbers that we were able to find. Peer-reviewed uh, journals, uh, you know, all the commercial databases, everything. And it's an absolute mess, right? It goes from minus 30 to plus 125. So you don't even have any idea if it's a liquid or a solid. And this is different from the ethanol, right? Because the ethanol had, you know, a very large number that were very close to minus 114 and then two out. There is not a clear number. There's not a clear trend here at all. And so, 
you know, as a chemist, once you've exhausted all of your sources, the only thing you have left to do is to actually order the compound and measure it yourself. And that's what we did. So the first thing is when we got it, it was clearly a liquid. So if we go back here, the 125, the 97.5 was out. And by the way, we also checked the purity of the sample. We took an NMR to make sure that it was the right compound and that it was pure. So, you know, at, the, at that point, we, we could be pretty confident that those high numbers were really, you know, we could be marked them as do not use. And we were also able to freeze it by putting it in, with some dry ice. So now the question was, how do you determine, you know, between the other numbers that, that are left? So I come back to the open notebook because it turns out that, you know, we really didn't fully appreciate how difficult it would be to measure a melting point of a liquid at room temperature. It's really, really difficult. And if it's above room temperature, it's no problem because you put a solid in the capillary and then you heat it, that's easy. But when it, once it's below room temperature, you know, it's, it's challenging. And so this is where the, the lab notebook really comes into play. How exactly did we do it? So one of the things that we did is we put it in a freezer that was at minus 15 for two days, and it didn't freeze. Okay, and so at that point, and that's you know part of the of the record on that lab notebook page, we marked in red all of these numbers. Okay, because we figured if it didn't freeze at minus 15, then it can't be five. It can't be 4.58. The only thing left is minus 30. But we didn't actually measure minus 30, right? Because that's actually difficult to do. And then I went and I gave a talk at a conference saying that we believe that the melting point is probably minus 30. And then I came back from the conference and it was frozen at minus 15. So, uh, so after 16 days, it was frozen. But this is just to show how non-trivial and how important it is all these little details that you might think are not important are actually absolutely critical. Because after two days, we did the best assessment that we could. We didn't have any other information, so we, we you know, wrote our conclusion as best we thought. Now with this, clearly, the, 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 the value of minus 30 could not possibly be correct, right? So we redid the, uh, the melting in a very slow way. And uh, we actually got a value around five degrees, and we actually added it. So that that's the value uh, plus five right here, open notebook. So that actually takes you to the lab notebook page where we did that, that experiment. So now we're as confident as we can be that the melting point is, in fact, around plus five. But you can see that through the whole journey, uh, it's really, really not, not clear at all, right? And that, unfortunately, is kind of typical for a chemistry experiment. Okay, so the, the, the take-home message here really is this whole concept of the fact, which is the lazy way to teach students, there really isn't anything as a fact, right? All you really have are measurements that are embedded within assumptions. And so if your assumptions, if you assume that the author did everything correctly or did it in a way that you would have done it, you, you know, you have limited information, and so you use the number that's given to you, but it might not be accurate because you don't know all of the assumptions. So with Open Notebook Science, what we're trying to do is give you all of our assumptions in as explicit a way as possible. You may, in fact, interpret it differently than we do, but at least you, have, you know exactly what it is that uh, we think that we did. Okay, so with all of these melting points, uh, we were able to, for example, come up with a smaller set where there was at least two measurements that were within five degrees of each other. So we started with 27,000, and if you look at where there's two measurements not, not, with, uh, not greater than five degrees separation, we had about uh, 2,700 of those, and we used that collection to build a model. Okay, but that was just our threshold. You could say, well, I want to do one that where the values are within 10 degrees or within 2 degrees. So that's the advantage of not having a trusted source model is that you, you, know, you can build your own thresholds and do whatever you need. But we, we have a model that actually works fairly well with our collection. 
And so now, you know, when you, for example, go to the link for the melting point of benzoic acid, you get a nice collection around 122. And then at the bottom, there's also a prediction of about 108 degrees, which is not bad for a melting point. If you want to know roughly where the compound is going to be a liquid or a solid, that, you know, is, is good enough for most purposes. So we have a lot of this uh, data. We have a lot of these data feeds, and we found it to be very important to deliver it for different purposes. So one of the purposes is, let's say I want to send you a link. This is vanillin, and I want the solubilities in all of the solvents that we collected for it. So there's a simple URL. See at the bottom there, you can copy that. You can put it in an email. You can put it in a Google spreadsheet. You can do whatever you want with it. And that's going to be a live link. So basically, if a, if a number gets added uh, later today by one of my students, then that's going to be reflected here as soon as they update the uh, Google spreadsheet. So that's one way to do it. And also, if you click on any one of those uh, links, it'll give you, for example, all of the, there's two measurements in THF. So that will give you the two measurements, and it's going to give you the links to the references. If it's a lab notebook, that's what it'll be. If it's a paper, it's going to give you the link to the paper. So again, we, it's very important to keep track of that whole provenance chain. Now, I mentioned Google Spreadsheets a little bit. Um, this is one of the, the more useful things that you can do with a Google Spreadsheet as a chemist. Basically, uh, we, uh, in collaboration with uh, Andy Lang, we can actually create uh, Google Apps. They're, they're called Google Apps scripts, which you can actually write inside of the, of the uh, Google spreadsheet. And it allows you to create specialized functions. So <clears throat> I gave you, some of you uh, a demo of this earlier. But it literally it's as simple as typing acetone and then hitting a button. And you will get the melting point will pop up inside the Google spreadsheet. You can hit another function for the predicted melting point for the solubility, for the density, for the molecular weight. So this is kind of neat because now you can think about the Google spreadsheet as a dashboard. You don't have to leave it to look up the molecular weight or any of these different things. And when you're planning a reaction, you actually need all these numbers. And you know we have it in such a way now that you don't have to leave the interface. It keeps everything nicely organized. It's quick. And it enables other people to double check your work very easily. So it's it's harder for a student to make a mistake and have the supervisor miss it, for example, because it's too much trouble, you know, checking. So if you're interested in this after my talk, I'd be happy to show you how it works and uh, and how you can develop it. So like I said, uh, coming up with if you wanted to include one of these, you just uh, click a link inside here, and then there's uh, some drop downs. And this drop down, right? It's just get MP for the, for the melting point, and there's all kinds of other things that you can do here. Uh, so, and then the number just pops up. So, this is how this is just one example of the kind of uh, project that, that you can do with this. So, let's say that you wanted to explore uh, the relationship between the length of the, uh, uh, an alcohol and it's, it's melting point. So this might actually be a project you know, that could be done in class with students. It could be um, you know, an end of term project. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you know, a chemistry student might be expected to do. Well, you, know, you can have them, you know, basically, if you ask them to do this, they would probably go to Wikipedia. They would get the first number that came up. They would put it in the spreadsheets, and they would be very pleased with themselves that they actually figured out what it is. Well. You know, hopefully I've given you some feedback that that's very, very dangerous to do. So the only way that you could actually really do this project with some I, some sense of uh, confidence is you'd have to get several, let's say at least three sources that are very close in melting point, right? And in that way, you could uh, do a plot, but you could also be secure about how, you know, that you know exactly um, how close the, the data points are. So, for example, here I'm going from methanol to ethanol to propanol. Right? If you remember when we clicked on the ethanol link, right, on the right here, it gives you minus 114 for most of them, and then there's two red ones. So that value of minus 114, <clears throat> we're pretty secure about. 
Now, we don't know if it's minus 114.1 versus 0.2, but we know that it's minus 114 as opposed to, let's say, minus 116. So it turns out that just from calling these functions from the Google spreadsheet, we can create a plot, and we can be quite confident that the plot actually does look like this. So <clears throat> basically, the experimental ones are in blue here, and it turns out that they look like they have this zigzag pattern. And because these are triple validated, we know that this is real. And this, this red line is the model that we built, and the model also has that uh, zigzag pattern. And so, you know, we know that, it, that, that it's something real and not just, uh, you know, random error that might be included in, 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 the, in the measurements. The same thing over here with, uh, with, these, with these alcohols, right? It goes down and then it goes back up. And these are triple validated, so that's real too. Now, here's a scenario where uh, if we do uh, cyclic primary means from three to six carbons, okay, we, if we look at the value of the cyclo, uh, pro, cyclopropylamine, or, sorry, the, the cyclobutylamine right here that I put a square under, there's only one value that we can find from all of the commercial databases, from the, the web, and everything, and that's minus four. So the other values might be triple validated, but this value, it isn't. It just has one value. So when you plot this, right, that might not be real. So that's the point that I'm making is that it's not just, you can't just go on Wikipedia and grab a number and plot something. Sometimes it's, you have to know what you don't know. So that for this number, you, you know, you, we'd have to, to measure it ourselves because there's no other source where it's actually been measured. Okay, and same thing over here. If you go on Wikipedia under alkanes, we actually found an error, right? This, the melting point of ethane is listed as minus 172. And in fact, you can find two sources that are close to minus 172. But because we have exhaustively looked at all the sources, you can see that the value is much more likely to be near minus 183. So once again, you know, this is not an easy task to know that that minus 172 is an error. And because it's in Wikipedia, I could easily see this chart get, you know, duplicated by students, by teachers. And so what we're trying to do here is to stop that duplication of error process. Okay, so if you're interested in these uh, Google Apps scripts, uh, there's, you go to onswebservices.wikispaces. And under Google Apps Scripts, all you have to do is basically just make a copy. So if you go to the reaction planning template, just the first thing you do, make a copy so that you don't edit the uh, template. And then uh, you can play around with it. And if you want a list of all of the functions that we've built, on that page at the bottom, there's an extensive list of every function, what it does, the accepted inputs, and the outputs that it'll create. Okay, so one of the things we can do by having all of these different services, we can do some higher level kind of processing. One of the things is give me a solvent for a reaction where I want the reactants to be soluble and I want the product to precipitate. We have a function like this, okay, that's based on all of the, uh, all of the data sources that we talked about. We recently created a recrystallization app. So if you have a compound that you want to recrystallize, all you've got to do is type the name of the compound, and it will use all of the different services to give you a solvent that might be good, you know, to re, to, to recrystallize. So, running out of time here. Basically, uh, re recrystallization is an important way to purify things because it scales easily, it's cheap, and uh, there really isn't a good way to uh, find a recrystallization solvent currently unless you actually go through all of these different steps that we uh, talked about. So the app looks like this. It'll work on a smartphone as well as a laptop. Uh, so, you, you know, you type the name of the compound, and it defaults to the minimum uh, solvent boiling point 60, maximum 80, minimum percent yield 80, endpoint temperature 25. So you can play with these. Uh, if you're not finding a solvent with these default uh, parameters, you can change it. Here's an example. If you uh, put in benzoic acid, it comes up with these four solvents. 
And if you click on one of the solvents, it gives you the temperature curve where what the solubility would be at different temperatures. So you can play around with that. And final thing here. So for, I'm like I said, I'm teaching chemical information retrieval again. We're about in the middle of the term. And one of the things that I've done differently this year is we've looked at the models for our melting points for our solubility. And we've made a list of the compounds that are outliers. And those are the compounds that the students have to pick from to actually find the correct values or find as many values as possible. So basically, the students uh, just basically go on this uh, on the sheet. And these are compounds that uh, were melting point outliers. For example, like this typical compound. The only melting point that we have is 145.5. The predicted is minus 25. And so it could be that the model is problematic. It could be that the, uh, the, 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 the known, that the reported experimental melting point is off. The only way to find out is to get as many uh, values as possible. So it's kind of neat that the, the students are correcting the chemical record as they're doing their assignment. They would have to do the assignment anyway. But in this case, their work is actually doing something very useful. Uh, the same thing with the solubility list, right? So benzoic acid and octanol, there's a huge variation in the um, solubilities that we've collected. And so it makes sense, all, all things being equal, it makes sense for the students to, uh, to get some more values for these. Okay, and we're also using ChemSpider I don't know if, if there's some of you that are doing chemistry with uh, ChemSpider. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very large, useful chemical database. And it does things like, for example, point out if there are missing stereocenters. So this is ibuprofen. And uh, so you don't have to be a chemist to understand this, but there's basically missing some information about whether it's right-handed or left-handed. And it turns out that the way that properties are recorded in literature if that is ignored, then it gets misassigned. So it's important, actually, that only the right-handed isomer, for example, the, the properties for that one are determined because if it's a mixture of two isomers, it will have different properties. So that's an enormous problem, and that's another part of curating these data sets, is to make sure that if you have a property for a molecule, it has to be a pure molecule and not a mixture of isomers. And basically, this is what the uh, validation sheet looks like. Students put their information here. There's the source value, source units, and then they got to convert it to a common unit. So in this case, if we're looking at a melting point, they convert it to Kelvin. And they have to put an image that actually proves what number they actually entered. And I verify these, each one of these uh, components. It's in Celsius. That clearly is cholesterol. And so once I verify that, then I actually write done. And at the end of the term, all of that gets added to the master sheet. And then those values are now usable uh, for any purpose. There's also a link that gives you all of the properties that we've collected that are not melting points or solubilities. So in the case of cholesterol, right? Uh, and if it's not there, we don't have it. This is basically all, all the properties. So the students have to basically make sure that they're not you know, redoing the property that we already have. So they have to check these, and if they don't already have it, they can pick any property that they want, and then this will get added. So going forward, we're trying to do uh, the same thing that we've done with melting points and solubilities for all kinds of other properties like boiling point, flash point, uh, log P, all of these things. And this is uh, called the OCPM project, Open Chemical Property Matrix. And basically it looks like this. I have, I have a student right now who um, is a chemistry major with a, a math minor. So it's a, actually a great application for her interests. And what she's doing is going through the literature and, and taking out equations that relate one property to another. So you can think of these as basically uh, gold that's buried 
that nobody's looking at. So we're taking them out, we're pr putting them out in the open, and we are automatically then generating values from these properties to determine where these equations actually work and where they don't work. So for example, for melting points, we have the experimental on the left, right in the left of the purple region. Those would come from our double validated set. So we have at least two values that are within five degrees of each other. So at least we're reasonably confident we have something close to the truth. The next one is the, is the model that we've actually built. And the other three are from, the, from a paper, Abrahamovitz. There's three different equations in that paper that make different assumptions. And so what we're doing is we're going to do thousands of these, and we're going to figure out where each one of these models actually works well and where it fails. And so the authors, for example, I think uh, only did uh, 85 compounds. So we're going to do them for maybe 10,000 compounds. And so now we're exposing it to the open. Anyone will be able to use this thing. So it's kind of like leveraging the work that someone has done but doing it in, in a much, much larger way than they otherwise could have. So that's a little bit on, uh, on this most recent project. And uh, so basically, yeah, I hope I made a case that it does make sense to, to, to be open in chemistry. And it also important to provide interfaces that make sense to the end user. So for example, the recrystallization app, as an organic chemist, you shouldn't have to know any of the modeling, any of the theory. You should just be able to type in your compound and get an answer. However, if you are a modeler, you should have access to all of the details of the algorithms and, and the data sets. And, you know, that, that does take some planning to, to, to make all those different feeds for different purposes. And uh, basically, I thank uh, Andrew Lang, all the code that you've seen. Uh, he's basically uh, written that. Bill O'Cree, uh, he was involved with the modeling, the, the solubility. Uh, he, he's longtime solubility uh, modeler. Tony Williams from ChemSpider. We use ChemSpider, a lot of their web services for these functions. So those happen in the background. You don't see them happening, but they're important. Matthew McBride and uh, Rita Atif, they did uh, the recrystallization and synthesis project. And most recently, Kayla Vivardi, she's the math miner doing the OCPM project. And uh, thank you very much for your time.